The next lecture, New President, New Deal, from 1933 to 1940. Oh yeah, and by the way, because I want you guys to do as good as possible on the paper, uh, you're not gonna be having a quiz on Monday over this stuff. Um, instead, I want you to be able to work on this uh, paper. All right, New President, New Deal, 1933 to 1940. Now, the first 100 days, you always want to look at a president's first 100 days because that's where he's going to get established, what he wants to do, and he's going to get things accomplished that he's going to be spending the rest of his administration either fighting to expand or prevent it from being stripped away. So before he even gets into the presidency, we have the lame duck period. That's that lovely little period when we have a new president elected, but it didn't take office until much later. Well, guys, during this thing, conditions still are dire. Yeah, home businesses, banks, and factories all closing their doors. Now, Roosevelt knows that he can't spend this time doing nothing. Instead, he surrounds himself with a group of advisors that are labeled as the brain trust by the press to try and figure out how they're going to uh, end the depression and return prosperity. That was basically their goal. Now, what's the reality of the situation? The reality of the situation they have no idea what they're doing. I mean, how much should the federal government be involved? How much should private enterprise be involved? You know, these are huge, complex problems. But the only thing they did know was that aggressive federal action, uh, or what they believed, was that aggressive federal action was needed to try to be a solution to this problem. Red. So by March of 1933, the banking system seemed ready for collapse. The public confidence in banks was nothing, causing a growing number of runs on banks as depositors demanded their money. Now, do you guys have any idea what a run was? Well, then, I'll show you with this clip from It's a Wonderful Life that if I put it up on YouTube, I'll get in trouble. So, uh, on his inauguration, Roosevelt assured the people that they had nothing to fear, but fear itself, and assured everybody that the economy was sound, and that he intended to ask Congress for sweeping powers to deal with the crisis. And basically taking an idea from a Hoover proposal, he came up with a national bank holiday that closed all the nation's banks. Three days, uh, three days later, he asked for the passage of an emergency banking act that allowed the Federal Reserve to examine the banks and certify those that were sound. It also allowed the Federal Reserve to support the nation's banks by providing funds and buying stocks and preferred banks. And then on Sunday, March 12th, so six days later, Roosevelt uh, started his fireside chats where basically he'd address the nation in his soothing and confident voice, reassuring Americans, telling them that the banks would be safe again. 60 million Americans return their money to banks, and within a month, almost 75% of all banks were up and running again. Ready for the next one. So the, and Roosevelt's plan to fight the Depression is kind of based in the three R's. Some of the sectors needed reform, some needed recovery, and some needed relief. Now, the first thing that he's going to focus on is abuses in the banking and stock market. He got the Banking Act of 1933, which reorganized banking and financial system, 
and created the Federal Deposit Insurance Program that provided federal insurance for accounts uh, of up to $5,000. Now today, that number, well actually it might even be more than this because my notes are a little old and I certainly don't have a bank account of $100,000, but they have $100,000, up to $100,000, meaning if your bank goes bankrupt, federal government that said it was okay is going to pay you up to your account's value, up to $100,000. Except today we don't call it the FDIP, we call it the FDIC, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. He also passed the Federal Securities Act in May of 1933 that required companies to provide information about their economic status and the Securities and Exchange Commission regulated stock market activities and set the margin rates. And he began the repeal of prohibition by passing the Beer and Wine Act that allowed for the manufacture and sale of 3.2% alcohol, beer, wine. And indeed, just to show you guys that you live in a day of liberation, it wasn't until like about six months ago that Oklahoma, in Oklahoma it used to be the highest alcohol content of beer you could get was 3.2. But they finally took that away, which is uh, really kind of revived the craft industry up there. And he started uh, working on getting the 21st Amendment passed, which basically would have repealed Prohibition. Ready for the next one? All right, seeking agricultural recovery. And sorry it gets so busy up there at the top of it. Maybe it was a bad background to choose. Now, why was it so important for him to deal with agriculture? Well, because the Farmers Holiday Association, that group led by Milo Reno, basically he was calling for farmers to strike and not plant any crops until they uh, received uh, profits growing the crops. He basically wanted parity or the value of something compared to its market value. So in this area, basically the farmers were asking for recovery, not relief. So the Secretary of Agriculture, Henry Wallace, he believed that the federal government needed to be involved in farming. So the Agricultural Adjustment Act gets passed on May 12th. And central to this plan was the Domestic Allotment Plan, which worked on overproduction, because the bad thing about agriculture here in America is that the Americans always did too good a job. They always made more crops which was driving the price down. So now basically the government was going to pay farmers for taking a crop, taking acreage of, of crops out of production. So basically they got together, figured out all the quotas at the national level, then they turned around and sent it to the states. The states then got together with the counties and figured out how much, this is how many acres of cotton. So how many acres of tobacco, how many acres of corn, how many acres of wheat need to be taken out of the system? Uh, and how are they going to pay for these subsidies? Well, they put a tax on food processors that was going to be used to pay farmers not to grow crops. Well, what does this do to farming? It turns it into a heavily capitalized industry. Because farmers aren't idiots. If I come out there with the county, you've got 100 acres of uh, cotton you're growing, and I pay you $100 to take away 10 acres of the crop, uh, 10 acres of the crops. Well, what land are you going to take out of production? You're going to take your worst land out of production. And then the farmers are going to use the $100 that they got to turn around and buy like fertilizer and start using scientific methods of farming 
which is just going to lead to overproduction again. Government figures this out. So the way they solve this is they put large taxes on like cotton and tobacco. In other words, if you produce more than the quota, we're going to charge you. Now you can plan it if you want to, but this tax was so huge that it wasn't worth it. And they also passed the Commodity Credit Corporation, which basically allowed farmers to go take a loan for their crop out from the government. And if the crop prices rose, the farmers could profit, pay back the loan, no big deal. If, however, the crop prices fell, then the government would simply come in, confiscate the crop, and the farmer could get another loan the very next year. Now, it sounds like everything's going great until the Supreme Court comes along. And in the case of Butler v. the United States, basically the, American, uh, the Supreme Court ruled that the government could not set up a quota system and that the special tax was illegal. So guys, if you can't go in the front door, what are you going to do? Use the back door. Seeking agricultural recovery continued. They started the Soil Conservation and Domestic Allotment Act, which basically paid farmers for the exact same crops, except now they called them uh, depleting crops because these crops would deplete the soil of its minerals. And so that's why they were getting paid to not grow it everywhere. And basically they did this until they could get a second agricultural adjustment act that would fall in line with the Supreme Court's ruling passed. Well, what was the consequence of all this activity with agriculture? Well, from 1932 to 1939, farm incomes actually doubled. Sounds great, but it took $4.5 billion in aid for the farmers to kind of get to that goal. And Roosevelt's policies of entitlements are accepted and seen as solutions. It did uh, establish uh, stable agricultural prices, but guys, we pay more for food than anywhere else in the world. Oh, uh -uh, man. And also the whole deal about entitlements. My uh, ex-father-in-law, uh, he was a stockbroker in Houston, made a lot of money. Bought uh, like 150 acres in Brenham, sold 110 acres of it, kept 40 acres for himself, and he never grew hay, but he got a check from the government each month from Texas for not growing hay. Seeking industrial recovery. Well, with the banking and agriculture fixed, they uh, turned to repair industry, and everybody's trying to pull in different directions with this. They pass a massive public works program with a 30-hour work week called the National Industrial Recovery Act, or the NIRA. It was made up of the Public Works Administration, that basically paid $3.3 billion to put people uh, to work. And the National Recovery Administration, or the NRA, that provided programs to restart the nation's industry. They put good old General Hugh Iron Pants Johnson, who was in charge of the War Industrial Board during World War I, in charge of it. And basically they put this symbol on all the stuff that had been made by the National Recovery Administration with the motto, we do our part. And it got a lot of public support at the beginning. Indeed, they even passed codes that reinstated uh, the outlawing of child labor and established child labor laws and allowed basically workers the right to organize and to bargain collectively. Now guys, why do you think that we were going back to outlawing child labor again?
What are we in? We're not in the great happiness. What are we in? Oh yeah, the great depression. And guys, 25% of the population is out of work. And in some places like New York, Ohio, Illinois, it's 33% of the population. The kids don't need jobs. Adults do. Because it wasn't until, what until, and this is so hard for, well, it might not be hard for you guys to think about it because it was still on the way back for you guys. But it wasn't until 1970, the 1970s that we became a society where both husband and wife had to work. Uh-oh, wrong way, run away. Well, of course, critics uh, criticize this. They call it the national runaround. Because uh, they often ignored code wages for uh, African Americans and women. And the wages they did have were low. And consumers lost faith in NRA goods when it basically generated price increases for competing goods. Then we've got the good old Supreme Court again in the sick, what's known as the sick chicken case or Schechter Poultry Corporation v. the United States. And basically, Schechter Poultry was a company, it was a New York company that did all of its business in New York. And basically, the Supreme Court ruled that the federal government had no authority to set national codes or wages and hours for companies that were involved in intrastate commerce. Because the federal government can only monitor interstate, not intra. Ready for the next one? Yes, you are. Then we get the Tennessee Valley Authority, the TVA, and the Rural Electrification Administration, or the REA. Now guys, the Tennessee River runs through still, to this day, some of the poorest uh, sections in the nation, okay? And the Tennessee River, it was a wild river. And basically, they were hoping to control it. So they built a refurbished 25 dams. And on these dams, they put hydroelectric turbines that could generate electricity. This made miles of river and lake navigable. In 1933, only 2% of the homes in the area had electricity. 12 years later, 75% of the homes had electricity. Now wait a minute, how in the world is building these dams going to create jobs and opportunities? Well, how many of y'all been to San Antonio? You been to the river one? Okay. 11 years ago, the city passed a $10 million bond to expand the river walk 1.4 miles. How'd that create jobs and opportunity? More construction workers. Well, not only more construction workers, but what might the construction workers be building? Huh? Stores that they Yeah, new stores, new restaurants. Uh, and guys, they did like they went, they totally refurbished, like the old Lone Star Brewery, turning it into like an artist quarters. I mean, it is so cool, all right? And guys, just like that, if you make the river navigable, well, you might want to open up a hotel at a real pretty place there. And if you open up a hotel and it starts running, you're going to have to hire staff to run it. You're going to have to hire people to do the laundry, to wash all the sheets and pillowcases. Someone might want to start a restaurant across the street. Someone might want to start a, a canoe rental place. Okay, and also guys, now that we have electricity, that means you're going to need electricians. That means that now people are going to have to buy, well, they don't have to, but they can buy electric washers, electric stoves. Indeed, it was so uh, powerful that they started working on the Rural Electrification Administration 
to where the federal government would pay to expand the electrical grid out to rural areas. Now this made Lyndon Baines Johnson incredibly popular here in Texas. Because if you, were, if you lived in the hill country and you were a woman that was about 35 years old, you'd have a hunchback. Why? Because they had to get their water out of the well. And in the hill country, the wells were dug very deep. I'm talking 75 to 100 feet. And the, just one gallon of water weighs eight pounds. Everybody here who's picked up a gallon of milk knows that. Now think, how, the women were responsible for getting all the water for the house. How many gallons of water do you think they'd have to use in the house today? Hmm? How much? 30 to 40. 20 to 40, let's say 40. 40 times 8, what is it? 32 to No, not that much. 320. Oh, yeah. Okay, but even 320. And you know, they'd have to be living. And of course, they'd be taken up by probably 42 pound buckets. But still, that's 42 pounds, 100 feet. What they do is get the rope, here we are at the well, get the rope, bend it over their back, and walk out the 100 feet. And there'd be a stake in the ground out there. They'd tie it to the stake. And then they'd go back and they'd pick up the water, they'd take it to the house, then come back and get the next thing of water and everything like that. Guys, and when they had electricity, now, that was incredibly liberating. Now they could just use an electric pump. And some people might say, yeah, but Professor Gallo, didn't they have windmills? Guys, the wind isn't always blowing. Remembering the forgotten man. Now who was the forgotten man? The forgotten man were all the men and women who faced unemployment and poverty. By March of 1933, unemployment was at an all-time high at 25% or 12 million people. And like I told you earlier, in some states like New York, Ohio, Pennsylvania, or Illinois, it was as high as 33%. They felt that federal responsibility had to be taken. So, uh, doing a replication of something he had done in New York State. Uh, Roosevelt began the Civilian Conservation Corps, which basically established over 2,650 Army-style camps to house and give a good environment to urban males from 18 to 25 years old. Now, why do you think they wanted to keep occupied males from 18 to 25 years old? And some of you ladies might not know this until you become moms and you have sons who become teenagers. So guys, if you don't find urban males from 18 to 25 something to do, go find something to do, and you won't like it. Usually not that great for society. And they, uh, like I told you, they gave them all this stuff, they paid them about a dollar a day, 30 bucks a month. Now, of course, they couldn't keep all of that money. Uh, $25 of it was sent back home. Now, guys, why do you think they only let them keep five bucks? Who's the money going to? Yeah, their family. Might be their wife, might be their mom and dad. And what's their mom and dad going to do with that? Survive. So you're going to take that money your son sent you, you're going to go buy bread. He said it takes one dollar to you, now you the grocer are getting a dollar. You're making a little money on the sale of that bread. Well guess who else is making money? That baker that sold you the bread, she's making some money. Why the hell is he making? The farmer that sold her the grain or the middleman who bought the grain from the farmer and sold it to the baker. All right, you're having much more people economically impacted if it's sent home. And the guys that are in the camps, they're getting three square meals a day. They're getting, you know, they don't have to pay anything for their housing. They don't have to pay anything for their clothes. That $5 was just fun money. All right, ready for the next one? Oh, wait, let me tell you what they did. 
basically what they did was it, it improved the national park system. It like cut out roads, built fire breaks, put up telephone poles, dug irrigation ditches, planted trees, and other kinds of uh, urban development. Indeed, if you've been in San Antonio, the sunken gardens down there, they were built by the Civilian Conservation Corps. Ready for the next slide? All right. The Public Works Administration was given $500 million to give to the states, but Henry Hopkins was the head of it, and he found out that some of the states didn't make very good use of their money. Uh, for example, Oregon thought that uh, all of the mentally and feeble and the elderly should have been chloroformed to death and saved the money for the able-bodied people. Now, before you say, that sounds wackadoo. Guys in Nazi Germany with uh, the Holocaust had its beginnings in killing off the retarded and elderly of uh, Nazi Germany. They were just weakening the race, according to them. Anyway, they said, hey, that's not a good idea. But instead, it helped uh, It helped uh, feed the homeless and care for them in transient camps. It paid 45 cents a day to unskilled labor, about 10 to skilled. Like in here in Texas, in Brownsville, they used the money to hire Mexican Americans to plant palm trees along Main Street and to paint churches. The Civil Works Administration gave out 4 million immediate jobs but a huge variety. It paid 30 to 50 cents a day for unskilled labor, a buck to a buck 20 for skilled, built more than half a million miles of roads, more than 40,000 schools, and at these schools, not only did it build them, it also paid for teachers to educate there. Indeed, here in Texas, a lot of that money was spent beautifying school grounds. And what was so cool is that, you know how like cement, the blocks of cement will usually have stamped in there, the company that made the cement or poured the concrete? Up at UNT, because I did graduate work up there, that's where I got my MFA in documentary production and studies. There used to be, until 2014, 15, there were still some slabs that had CWA stamped into them. Of course, they were old and some of them were cracked, lasted a long time, they've all been replaced now. <laughs> Remembering the Forgotten Man continued. They also created the National Housing Act, which created the Federal Housing Administration that provided federally backed loans for mortgages and repairs. Now, why are homes so important, but apartments not as much? Well, not only that, but houses are also an investment. You know, if you want, to, if you want that thing to increase in value, which everybody does, you've got to keep it painted. You've got, if it not breaks, you've got to fix it. If your lawn, you've got to mow it. So you're going to be spending money in the local uh, economy for your house. Not only that, but if you can afford to pay your property taxes, those are going back into the community, and like here in Texas, helping out with the schools. Ready for the next one? The second hundred days. All right, guys, like I told you, the first hundred days is where you try to get everything established. The second hundred days, that's when you start to face blowback. And, and or try to advance what you were able to achieve. Now guys, just like, first off, it should come as no surprise. Who were the political adversaries of Trump? The Republican President Trump. The Republican Party? Huh? The Republican Party? Yeah, who, no, who was against Trump? Oh, the Democrats. Yeah, the Democrats. Now, guys, who 
do you think is against uh, Biden? The Re I mean, guys, that's as old as time, yin and yang. So first thing, because Roosevelt was a Democrat, it's come from the surprise that the Republicans were against him. Um, a lot of people thought that his government expenditures uh, were a social threat to free enterprise. Then Roosevelt took a, off the gold standard in April of 1933. And in 1934, he nationalized the gold deposits, which devalued the dollar from being worth a dollar to being worth only 59 cents. Yeah, the Hearst newspapers began to call Roosevelt's plan a raw deal that would only soak the successful. So they joined together with leaders of American business and formed the American Liberty League. The old bell is still ringing. That was going to stand up for values that were right. Now, guys, you expect that. What you don't expect, though, are the guys that are inside of your tent saying you're not going far enough. Now, who were the guys that were on the left that were saying, Roosevelt, you did a good job, you need to go further. First one was Father Charles Coughlin, Catholic priest who had a national radio show. He had a national radio show that reached an audience of more than 30 million Americans. And he would uh, use his time on the radio to lash out at those who didn't give relief. So as you can guess, he really hit hard against Hoover. And even though at first he supported Roosevelt, uh, by 1934 even Roosevelt wasn't going far enough. He formed the National Union for Social Justice or the People's Lobby that helped out politicians who helped out his aims. Well, what did he want? Well, he advocated a federally guaranteed uh, national income. He wanted a redistribution of wealth. He wanted tougher anti-monopoly laws and a nationalization of the banking system. And within a year, he had more than 5 million members. The second guy is a 70-year-old doctor by the name of Dr. Francis Townsend. He was inspired slash disgusted by the sight of three old ladies that were groveling through the trash looking for food. Uh, basically, because of their age, they were denied work relief. Uh, they didn't have any money. They couldn't own any property. So basically, that was their lot in life. And he thought that wasn't right. He thought that there needed to be a uh, national, excuse me, a national pension program uh, where basically you'd get $200 a month. What would you use to pay for that? Basically, a national sales tax of 2%. He had thousands of clubs that joined in support, probably numbering several million, including 60 members of Congress. Now, guys, um, isolated, these guys weren't a threat. But could anybody unite them and possibly form a third party which would run against Roosevelt and weaken the vote? Yeah, that guy would be the Democratic governor slash senator from Louisiana, known as Hugh Long, the kingfish. He had a grandiose oratory style, flaming red hair. I believe he was six foot four. And guys, he went on a massive building program. He built roads, he built schools, he built hospitals where they've never been built before. But how did he get his nickname, the Kingfish? Well, he got his nickname because if you've ever seen a Kingfish hunt, basically it goes and it skims along the top of the water and picks it up. Basically, he gives bribes and his kickbacks from all these programs. And most people knew what was going on. But they loved him. Why? Because he was providing jobs. If you're going to be building a road, 
Your brother might be able to get a job. If they're building a hospital next to you, your pregnant sister or sister-in-law might be able to get to it, which might save her life if she's having a child. And that wouldn't have been there if it wasn't for this guy. In 1929, they actually put him, uh, charged him with accepting bribes. The case fell apart. So in 1930, he runs for a senator and he hand chooses his successor. Uh, he started the Share Our Wealth Society, where he felt that um, all uh, wealth, more than a million dollars, and all inheritances, more than five million dollars, should be taxed and confiscated by the government. This, he argued, would give every family about two thousand dollars a year. Now, he knew that this thing wouldn't work. And when he was asked by a reporter, what are you going to do when the people figure out that this won't work? He said, oh, don't worry, I'll have something else new for them then. Now, once again, this was a big concern to Roosevelt, but on June 21st, 1935, thanks to Carl Weiss, he didn't have to worry about it anymore. Why? Because he was shot by Carl Weiss. The bullets that killed him, however, came from his bodyguards. So I'll let y'all figure that one out. Anyway, all of this pressure caused a shift in focus for Roosevelt. He felt he had to take action against this new populist uh, threat that was rising. So he changed his focus from business uh, to directly to people. He needed more work relief. So Congress allocated five billion dollars to be divided among all of his alphabet letter agencies and his new program, the Works Progress Administration. The wages would vary from $13 a month, that shouldn't be weak, uh, in the north, $12 in the south. And between 1935 to 1938, the WPA hired more than 2.1 million people doing manual labor, building roads, schools, public buildings. You got it. He had an Arts for the Millions program that hired writers, composers, photographers, musicians, historians, and others. And by 1939, an estimated 30 million people had seen WPA plays. His mural programs reflected the positive and the common man. It created more than 2,500 murals and 100,000 paintings. The WPA also made efforts to help out women, minorities, young adults, students. Indeed, 300 to 400,000 women were employed each year. It worked to ensure that African American employment in the Northeast states, however, they still had to deal with segregated work camps, even up north and down here in Texas. Uh, and Texas has a weird thing about this, because on one side with like the WPA, they put the black, the African American camp inside of the white work camp. So if you wanted, if you were uh, African American and you wanted to come in and apply for a job, it was difficult for you to know how to get in. So Texas had the lowest percentage of blacks working in these programs. However, Texas also built up its state parks during this time and it took uh, bids from black companies. It would take bids from anybody. And black owned companies actually built two of our uh, state parks. All right.
Namaste. Y'all do the same now. Memory being paid. All right. The Social Security Act. Uh, basically, Social Security was to be a permanent modification of our government's role in society. I mean, the only 15% of Americans and workers were covered by pension plans. And so they want to create a governmental uh, pension plan that, of course, scared the hooey out of uh, conservatives because they were afraid that it would take away people's willingness to work. But... Um, Congress provided a pension plan for retirees, 65 or older, who were to receive payments of 10 to 85 bucks a month. And the more a worker paid into the system, the larger his share would be. Uh, basically, the Federal Insurance Contribution Act, or FICA, was, created, was a new tax that was cr created to cover Social Security. And so, uh, have you ever had a job out in the, pri the public sector? Um, yeah, I got Social Security taxes taken out. Our friend FICA that appears on every year like, son of a gun. Um, but uh, <laughs> the funny thing is, the first generation, they didn't put anything into it. So, all your money that's supposed to be going away for you is actually paying now for your grandparents and for everybody else that's on Social Security. And the thing about this is, it used to be 65 was an old age. A lot of people didn't live that long, or if they did live, you know, they might live into their 70s. But now we have people living beyond 100. So it's really tricky. The National Labor Relations Act, also known as the Wagner Act, strengthened the unions by putting the power of the government behind the workers' right to organize. And by 1936, unions uh, contribute the most to the uh, Democratic Party as a group. The Revenue Act uh, was basically a new graduated income tax that Roosevelt had passed and because of its wording, uh, you know what a graduated income tax is, right? If the more money you have, the more taxes you have to pay. Uh, but because wealthy people can usually hire the tax advisors and attorneys and accountants. Um, because of this new uh, act, uh, basically the wealthiest 1% increased their wealth 2.3%. So they controlled basically 30% of the nation's wealth. Now the New Deal in society. The New Deal and Urban America. Well, during this time, you had more and more people moving to the cities. Why? Because the cities is where the opportunities might be found. The only problem is you had all these poor people moving to the cities, and the cities didn't have the resources to pay uh, for the upkeep of all these people and the relief. I mean, from 1929 to 1933, property values declined 18%, and most of the inhabitants don't even pay their property taxes because they can't afford it. Like 33 of the 145 largest cities in America collected only 75% of their property taxes. So in order to save their money, the cities had to like cut back on public jobs, you know? Less teachers, less policemen, less firemen. Also, some cities printed their own money that was only good in that city to try to keep the wealth in that area. And in Houston, the banks uh, loaned the city so much money that they were given key positions on boards to decide what got paid for, what got cut, etc. But despite this, you still have huge projects like uh, San Francisco's Golden Gate Bridge completed, as well as Boulder Dam. In popular culture, in film, you had the big man, the big pictures like Gone with the Wind, Wizard of Oz, Top Hat, Broadway Melody that allowed people to escape, you know, the problems of daily life. Romantic comedies were still incredibly popular, 
where the rich guy or girl would fall in love with the poor guy or girl. But an interesting change happened in uh, gangster films. In gangster films, it used to be in the 1920s that the gangster was kind of the hero that people looked up to. Well, during the Depression, it's the cops and detectives that are trying to keep society safe that become the heroes. Now, during this time also, to try and get more people coming to the films, films were getting a little bit more and more risque. So to cut back on behavior that might be seen as indecent, uh, Hollywood passed the production codes, the Hay production, the Haynes production, Hayes production codes that would limit uh, offensive material. Ready for the next slide? But even more important though was radio, because 90% of all the homes in America had radios. Comedies were really important. I mean, Amos and Andy was the biggest show during this time. You had comedians like the Marx Brothers, uh, Jack Benny, George Burns, Gracie Allen, that people really liked listening to. Uh, move over American Idol, because in 1934 you had the original Amateur Hour where regular people could come on the show, sing songs, and become stars. In 1937, quiz shows started to become very popular, as well as radio serials that basically people would listen to. They have a different show on every week. These shows were like Dick Tracy, The Lone Ranger, The Shadow. And on Halloween night of 1938, the guy who did the voice of The Shadow, Orson Welles, and his Mercury Theater Players on the Air, uh, did a rendition of H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds, where aliens come and attack uh, the world, and even though they're eventually defeated, um, you know, this America, the world has to go through this scary attack. And they started out the show, you know, saying, hey, this is War of the World, but then they cut to like an orchestra playing. And the orchestra played for about five minutes. So a lot of people may have forgotten, or if you came into the show late, you wouldn't have known. And then all of a sudden, we interrupt this program to bring you this special news bulletin and treated the whole thing. And you know, because it's radio and you're just hearing it, a lot of people totally believed this was going on. You had people getting into accidents, had people firing off their guns at night. And the next day he was like, hmm, yeah, sorry. Because it just sounded so realistic. And of course it vaulted him to even further heights of fame. A new deal for minorities and women. This is where we get to Eleanor Roosevelt, who was the first truly active first lady who crisscrossed the country listening to coal miners, waitresses, farmers, housewives, and so on. She would give hope and explain the benefits of the New Deal. She labored hard to ensure that women got a fair deal, like she held news conferences just for female reporters. Now, what were the realities she was fighting against? Well, NRA codes maintained lower wages for women. Uh, waitresses, agricultural and domestic workers weren't covered by Social Security, nor did they get a minimum wage, and they made up 10% of the WPA workforce. Of African Americans, uh, by 1938, 30% of African Americans were on some form of federal relief. They began leaving the Republican Party in droves, joining with the Democratic Party. Now, of course, discrimination during this period made it difficult for them to get like the skilled labor jobs. Usually they have to take an unskilled labor. And what was to be a low income housing project would be switched to a middle-class housing project almost overnight. You did have things like when the Daughters of the American Revolution invited a world-renowned opera singer, Marian Anderson, to 
come sing at their hall. When she arrived, they discovered she was black. Blacks weren't allowed in the hall. So they canceled the concert. In response to this, Eleanor Roosevelt uh, dismissed her membership to the Daughters of the American Revolution and planned to have a public showing of Miriam Anderson at the Lincoln Memorial that was attended by more than 75,000 people. Ready for the next one? For Latino Americans. Well, in San Antonio, 30% of the African American and 29% of the Mexican Americans were on some form of relief. Now, the WPA and PWA would usually pay more than they receive in the private sector, like $8.54 a week versus $6.02 a week. Well, from 1934 to 1935, San Antonio's pecan shellers went on strike, led by union organizer Red Emmett Cunha. Basically, these guys were working a 54-hour week and only getting paid 3 to $4. So the strike went on, and finally in 1938, they won. And by the way, what's that test that you have to take that proves that you graduated high school here in Texas? It's gone and gone so many names. Anyway, she's been on the test for the last two years. What about Native Americans? Well, under the Indian Reorganization Act of 1934, it returned land and community control to tribal organizations and provided for Indian self-rule on the reservations. The failures of the New Deal. Well, the biggest enemy of the New Deal had always been the Supreme Court, Roosevelt and the Supreme Court. Basically, remember, these were the guys that had turned down the Agricultural Adjustment Act. These were the guys that bulked against the NIRA and the uh, national wage policies. Um, they were getting ready to hear uh, cases on Social Security uh, and the TVA, and Roosevelt, right before the election of 1936, tried to come up with a packing scheme. He said, you know what, these guys are old, most of them are older than 70, why don't we go ahead and appoint one new justice for every justice that's currently seated? So in other words, there'd be nine new Supreme Court justices that, of course, he could pick. So they kind of leaned towards his favor, or so he believed. Well, thankfully, this didn't happen because two weeks after the election, eight of the justices resigned, uh, something that Time Magazine called the switch in time that saved nine. Ready for the next one? The resurgence of labor. Now, union organizers had found that it was useful to tell workers that Ro President Roosevelt wanted them to unionize as he had passed so much legislation that was favorable to unions. In 1934, you had 1,800 strikes involving more than 1.5 million workers. And in 1935, you have a new union push called the Committee for Industrial Organizations that basically started to get industries that hadn't been picked up by the original AFL. You know, like automobile workers, rubber uh, workers, uh, workers in electrical systems. And in 1935, they invented a new kind of strike, the sit-down strike, where instead of protesting outside of the buildings, if you were a worker, you'd go into where you were supposed to start your job, where you did your shift, and when the siren rang for you to start work, you'd just sit down. That way it was very difficult for the, for the company to come in and get you out of there. 
Uh, it was, it started at Akron, Ohio, at a tire factory there. They won that one, and then the United Automobile Workers told GM in 1936 that they were going to, uh, they had some demand. Now, was GM being nice to the workers? No, they had laid off more than half of all their workers. Basically, they had gone from 435,000 down to only 244,000. It had dropped wages from $33 down to only $20. And it spent almost $72,000 in union busting activities in 1935. So on November 30th, 1936, workers in Flint, Michigan uh, began a sit-down strike. And so what did GM do? GM shut off the heat. Well, was this a big deal? Yeah, because it was only 16 degrees outside. But the workers stayed in. Finally, on January 6th, they sent in the cops who were armed with tear gas, billy clubs, etc. The workers were armed with fire hoses and handmade slingshots that fired two-pound door hinges. Uh, in the battle that ensued, the little skirmish, 14 workers were injured compared to 37 cops. GM asked for uh, the governor to, pull out, to call out the National Guard to break up the strike. Governor refuses to do it. So eventually, uh, they have to give in. And so powerful was the sit-down strike that all they had to do was threaten one at U.S. Steel. And U.S. Steel acquiesced to their demands. By 1937, you had 4,700 strikes where the union won 80% of the time. Union membership soared at the same time. Oh, <laughs> union membership soared and Time Magazine stated that sitting down had replaced baseball as America's national pastime. Now some of these strikes though turned violent. For example, at a Memorial Day parade in Chicago, in 1937 a rally of workers and their family was attacked with 10 killed, 90 wounded, and 67 arrested. You know, they start to begin saying that, like, oh, the unions are just a bunch of communists to try to weaken them, but it's not really that effective. Ready? The end of New Deal legislation. Well, Congress, led by the Southern Democrats and Midwestern Republicans, start to block or impede social legislation, like the National Housing Act of 1937, the Fair Labor Standards Act of 1937, basically Congress feared the centralized uh, executive management and control uh, was taking away legislative power. So they said, hey, you've gotten too big, you've gotten too strong, you need to cut this out. So what does Roosevelt do? Instead of fighting against it, he says, oh, okay, I guess you're right. Immediately, he cuts 1.5 million jobs. Unemployment rushes up to 19% in what was called the Roosevelt Recession. Congress, in response to this, said, oh, oh, we're sorry, we're sorry. Most of the jobs were uh, put back. And uh, the 1938 Fair Labor Standard Act was passed that set a maximum work week of 44 hours, a minimum wage of 25 cents an hour. It outlawed child labor. And by 1939, the economy had reached back to the point it had been a decade earlier, in 1929. Only deal was now you had 3.3 million people on relief. In other words, on the government dole. For the next one. New Deal's impact. Well, the New Deal was a failure. It failed to achieve full economic recovery. Millions of people were still unemployed. But now the relationship between government 
and the people is totally altered. I mean, before this, the government barely touched the lives of most Americans. Afterwards, it becomes a part of everyone's everyday life. Now, the, what then was the one item that pulled us out of the Great Depression? It's our next focus of study, World War II.